on Saga and all that intensely, but we got to get ignored. <laughs> I don't want to talk about iPhones too much in the service here because uh, I have problems with mine too. They're good and they're not good. Is it one now? Well, I'm not bad. I'm, I'm trying not to bash anybody. You guys are just kind of pulling me in here. Stop it. All right. Well, let's jump into the word. So before we get into the scripture, I want to say that we're going to have a healing service on the 12th of this month. Okay. And some of you have been here for the healing service. It's, you know, God heals anytime he wants to. Yep. But Amen. it's nice to have a, a special service every so often that's kind of just set aside because people come with an expectation. You know, yes, God can heal us anytime, anywhere. But whenever you have a healing service, a lot of people are like, whoa, I got to check that out. And so they come in here and then the, what, the service will be different. It's just a different type of service. And it's just very encouraging, a lot of... Um, stirring and faith and fun and then uh, and people are always healed every time we have one people get healed every service we've had that was a healing service people have been healed and so praise god so we're going to have a healing service on the 12th so praise god anybody want to have some healing right before the holidays before christmas yes i'll take it healing's good anytime but hey this is a good time as any so here we go we're going to jump into the word now we're going to be in luke chapter 12 verse 41 through 53 a lot of good stuff in these scriptures. All right. So, verse 41. Lord, Peter asked, does this apply only to the 12 of us, or is it for everyone else as well? And Peter was referring back to the previous scriptures, which is verse 35 through 40. And Jesus was teaching them to always be ready. He said, always be ready. He said, don't, don't, don't get all, don't just relax. Always be ready. Always be about the Father's business. Always uh, be, in, be anticipating my return every day. Jesus saying, always be ready and be eager and anticipate and be faithful. That's what he was telling. And that's what Peter was referring back to. Peter says, well, does this, this always being ready, this faithfulness, this anticipation of return, this only apply to the 12 of us. And actually, this, the most translations just say to the disciples. Or is it for everyone else? That means everyone that are in that, this listening right then in that group, in that setting. Um, and I think it's really neat because Jesus, what he does is in verse 42, he actually doesn't actually answer uh, specifically Peter's thing, but he goes into a parable that does a great teaching. Uh, so here's Jesus' reply to Peter, but actually it's a reply to all the disciples and the group there. So in verse 42, the Lord replied, A master will delegate authority in his house to a trustworthy and thoughtful manager who understands his master's desires. And the household manager will, and this, what it is, I got two translations of this part of 42, the last part of 42. I, 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 it says right here, and the household manager will serve others what they need at exactly the right time. That's the Passion Translation. And then the ESV down here says, give them their portion of food at the proper time. I put two translations up here for a reason. Now, let's go back to the beginning of 42. A master will delegate authority. You know, Jesus is the master. So this parable is actually about him. He delegates authority in his house. This is in the church. This is an in-house thing. He delegates authority in his house, in his church, to trustworthy, faithful, uh, reliable, honest, honorable, uh, humble people. Okay? It says, and... Listen to this, a thoughtful manager. I like that. A trustworthy and thoughtful manager. And some translations say steward, but the manager is really neat. Because see, the key here is when, it, when authority is delegated, it goes to faithful, dependable, trustworthy stewards. People who are making the most of what they got now. You with me? There's, there, I've, known, I've known so many people over the years who didn't want to make the most of what they had because they were looking for something else. They're waiting for something to happen tomorrow. Like, oh boy, when Jesus comes through there, then I'm really going to get involved. Then I'm really going to serve. Then I'm really going to be a blessing. You know, when that happens, then I'm going to do all this stuff. And uh, what's that? That's an old gig. Yeah. Hey, good for you. What about now? I need some help today. You know? But see, that's what Jesus is saying. It's really good because to get authority 
in Christ's church, you have to be making the most of what you've got, not waiting on something you don't. Isn't that cool? And that's a big thing, because stewardship's about, stewardship ain't about what you ain't got, is it? <laughs> stewardship's about making the most of everything God blesses us with. Everything he gives us is precious. Doesn't matter how small or how big. But here's the key right here, too. Look at the end of this. He, he gives to thoughtful and trustworthy men who understand their master's desires. That's relationship. You know what I mean? So these people who are steward and they're making the most, they're also staying very close and intimate with Jesus, and they understand what he wants. They understand how to make the most of what he's given them. They understand how to use it for kingdom advancement in lives of people. Isn't that neat? But that's what this is. Jesus, this is just beautiful. This one verse right here you could preach. I mean, you could preach a series on it. It's great. But see, you have to stay close to Jesus and know what's on his heart to make the most of what you got. And then you, while you're doing that, God will give you promotion in, the, in, in his house in the church. And see, here's the thing right here about knowing where it says, understand the master's desires. This is really important because when God gives you authority, Authority is a big deal in, in, a, in the church. Authority is in the church because somebody in authority has to serve others. You see that? And I've talked about that. The way up in authority is, the way, is down. In other words, the, the more you humble yourself, I mean really, not, you know, not just faking it out, but the more you really humble yourself and serve, the more you're going to get promoted in the kingdom of God. But look at what happens whenever you actually have authority. You use it to serve others what they need at exactly the right time. Isn't that neat? Authority will cause you to say the right thing at the right time. Authority will cause you to be in the right place at the right time. Authority will cause you to encourage somebody with the right stuff at the right time. You with me? That's part of authority. Authority is just really being a, a, a like Paul says, a cup that just runs over constantly. You're constantly pouring out and pouring out and giving and pouring out and touching lives and speaking that word in season and blessing and encouraging and saying, come on, let's do this. But it's all, it's, there's a timing in all this, and only those who are given authority by Jesus can walk in that kind of grace. It's huge. And, I, and, and the ESV, and several of them say the portion of food. I like that because really that's what leaders are doing, aren't they? Every time they pat you on the back, they're giving you some nourishment. <laughs> Every time they say, come on, let's go, that's food for the soul, isn't it? So it, there's a lot here. I'll move on. But we could, you could stay here for a while. This is just really some good stuff Jesus has got here for us. Verse 43 and 44. And whenever his master returns, he will find that his servant has served him well. I promise you the master will reward him generously, and he will be placed as an overseer of everything he owns. I like this because Jesus is kind of he's kind of touching back into the scriptures that I that I was referencing back in verse 35 through 40. Uh, to always be ready, to always anticipate Jesus' return. And it's kind of neat because if we're if we're day-to-day -day serious about our relationship with God and we're serving or being faithful, it doesn't matter when he returns, does it? We're ready. And that's what Jesus is saying. He said, Hey, whenever the master returns, whenever I come back, it doesn't matter when. And I'm going to change one. I will find my servant serving me well. That was a paraphrase from Dana. But that's really what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, if you're doing all this stuff and you're really being busy and you're serving and you're stewarding and you're being faithful, it don't matter when I come back. I'm going to find you serving me well. It won't be a big surprise. Like, uh-oh, I blew that one. <laughs> and said, look at this. Jesus says, I promise you the master will reward him generously, and he will be placed as an overseer of everything he owns. You see, if Jesus comes back, when he comes back, in the, his, his return, his second coming, and when he finds us faithful, doing what we're supposed to be doing, he's going to actually promote us in more significant matters, eternal things. You know, we're doing eternal stuff now, but whenever he comes back and we actually get our glorified body, which, amen to that, I'm, anybody game for a glorified body? <laughs> <laughs> Trade in this used Buick on one of those, you know. <laughs> Can be game for that, but uh, but yeah, but we'll be. He will actually entrust us with more authority in the kingdom, in in, the, in that kingdom. I'm excited about that. So praise God. So let me see. Let's keep going. So I want to kind of touch on. Let's see. Here we go. 
Luke 16, 10. It says, the one who faithfully manages, now here we go on that managing stewardship thing again, the little he has been given will be promoted and trusted with greater responsibility. Isn't that good? And, man, we are all so blessed. We are, and I know I say that a lot because I mean it. I mean, I'm blessed as I can be. Man, I came home. We live in a manufactured home. I walked in that son of a gun. I was like, my gosh, we're blessed. We got back from visiting our kids. I was like, man, we are, look at this house. We're blessed. You know, I don't have to have a $5 million house to be blessed. Do you? I don't have to have a $1 million house. If you got one, good for you. But, <laughs> but I don't have to have that to be blessed. You with me? I mean, man, we, we, if we're dry, we're warm. We're, we're clothed. We eat well. Ain't nobody here starving to death. I'm looking around. I see you. <laughs> but, but, see, what, what's that? Like? Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I poked a nerve, it was unintentional. <laughs> but the truth is, is, I mean, all you got to do is just, just stop anywhere you're at and look at yourself and look around and you can praise God. Because we've all got plenty of stuff to manage, don't we? Uh, he's been generous to us. He has. You see, that's that's really the, one of the important things of stewardship. You know, the Bible talks about it a whole lot. You don't matter how little or how much you have, you've got to make the most of it. You've got to be grateful for it. you really got to be grateful. That's a big thing. Because if you're not grateful for what you got, you won't get more and you won't be grateful if you do. So, anyway, let's keep rolling. There's a, there's, I told you there's a lot in the Word tonight. There's always a lot in the word, isn't it? <laughs> Amen. Verse 45. But what if that servant says in his heart, My master delays his coming, and who knows when he will return? Because of the delay, the servant elevates himself. You see that? That is not God promotion. That is a, a person bullying and pushing and climbing their way into a position that God didn't give them. Okay? So, you know, Lord ain't come, you know, I don't know what's going on, but he's not here, so I'm going to take matters into my own hands. And, look at this, he, he elevates himself into a position he wasn't given, or she wasn't given, and uses a, a, that false authority to mistreat those in the master's household. See, that happens in churches. That's in the master's household. That's a church again. There are people in positions of authority in churches that God didn't give that authority to. You know that? It happens in churches. It does. But I'm going to tell you what, even if a person elevates themselves, God will get glory out of their mistakes. You know that? He will. If that person promotes themselves and they mistreat you, hey, God's got your back. God's going to make it work for good. God's going to take care of you. That's the way God is. So it says, instead of caring, see, the, the true God-given leadership is supposed to care. Care for the ones he was appointed to serve. He abuses the other servant, both men and women. He throws drunken parties for his friends and gives himself over to every pleasure. Isn't that a mess? Now, you understand, this is a believer. This is talking about a believer. Have you ever seen any believers uh, fall off the wagon and backslide like that? Yeah. It happens, doesn't it? It does. It's a shame, but it happens. But see, this person, and you see, there's, there's a progression here. There's a progression. The, this, the person just start throwing parties and did, doing all that. Started reasoning his, his heart. Well, you know, I don't know when the Lord's coming back. You know, I kind of, I got plenty of time, and, and I'm kind of tired of serving here. It's about time I took some authority. You with me? You can see a progression of that going into that, into abuse, into a, a just a, a loose, messed up lifestyle. But that's the way sin is, isn't it? Well, I'm trying to remember there was a saying from, gosh, a long way back. Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay. And eventually, it'll kill you. That was from 30 years ago or so. I, I probably got it botched up, but I tried to remember. I definitely remember the first part. But that's the truth with sin. And I think James talks about, you know, God doesn't, God doesn't tempt anyone. He says people are tempted when they're drawn away by their own lust, their own desire, and then they're enticed. The world's got the right bait. And then it says, it basically, and then when, when sin is conceived, basically whenever that thought, you start entertaining it, it gives birth to some a new life. And then it leaves you dead. And that's what James talks about. I mean, we could look at that some more, but, but that's the way the, the sin is. We kind of toy with it, and then it toys with us, and then it takes us on a road we don't want to go. 
um, terrible. But this backslidden Christian, or says basically, his friends are the world. He's abusing the Christians, the brothers and sisters, but he's having buddies with people who are, you know, living terrible lifestyles. So this person's kind of like, it's okay to be friends with the world. I'm not telling you not to. Jesus was the best friend the world ever had. <laughs> but, but the thing is, is that you can see a contrast of abuse of God's people and basically acceptance, encouragement of lifestyles that are not good. So another James 4, 4 says, you adulteresses, disloyal sinners, flirting with the world and breaking your vow to God. Do you not know that being the world's friend, that is loving the things of the world, See, not loving people, it says the things. You're loving things that are not of eternal significance. It says it's being God's enemy. So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And man, please, like I said, it isn't friendship with, with non-believers. Praise God for being friends with non-believers and loving them and, and showing them what, showing them something different than the world's giving them. And helping them meet Jesus. That's a beautiful thing. But whenever you are kind of fleshly going that route and not and there's nothing different between you and the world that's a problem all right let's keep going it says let me tell you what will happen to him or her his or their master will suddenly return at a time that shocks them what do you know and he will remove the abusive, selfish servant from his position of trust. You see that? Even though the first person took the position, there was still a position of trust. You see that? Mm -hmm. See, we don't always know whether God gave him the position or not. <laughs> and so there's trust involved. There's always a trust. It says the master will punish him and assign him a portion with unbelievers. And I'm going to do 47 and pull these together. Is every servant who knows what pleases his master, yet does not make himself ready. See, that's an internal work. You with me? You know what God wants you to do. You know what he requires. We got, we're reading the same book, and the person doesn't do the work. They don't do what they need to for their life. And refuses to put his master's will to action. See, that's the stuff we do for others. See, we've got to work on ourselves, and we've got to help other people. So both those are in there will receive many punishing blows. And in context, I believe this is very very much the same thing. So the Lord's going to come, uh, remove that servant who knew what to do and didn't do it for themselves and didn't do it for others and receive many punishing blows. And as I was meditating and chewing on this, I, have, I believe this has nothing to do with physical blows here. I don't believe it does. What I believe it, what I believe it has, let's see, well, I don't I've lost my notes as always. <laughs> Having too much fun. <laughs> but, let's see. Yeah, here we go. I believe what it means, many punishing blows, I believe that refers to a loss of rewards, a loss of eternal things, a loss of things that would, that would be amazing to have in that glorified body. Every time you, you know, you, when you go to the Lord, he says, well, you knew what to do and you didn't do it. Okay? That means you lost this but you lost this eternal blessing. You lost this eternal privilege. And that's going to be, that's no different than a blow to the soul, is it? That's going to be a blow to the soul when that person realizes that that stupid thing they were doing for a month or whatever before the Lord returned is going to cost them an eternal blessing. Huge. And I think that's what it means. I just, when the whole time I was reading and talking to the Holy Spirit, I just felt like, no, this isn't nothing to do with physical stuff. These are eternal blows. These are blows to the soul of privileges and blessings that would have really been enjoyed. I mean, can you imagine when you stand before the Lord? And, and if he was to say, which I'm sure he won't say that to any of us, but if he was to look at us and say, well, you know, you had this opportunity and you blew it. So guess what? You blew the opportunity and that opportunity equaled this reward. So you're not going to have this reward for eternity because you blew it. Now imagine what you would feel in that moment. You'd be like, there might be some blows at that point of you hitting yourself. Start it! <laughs> but, yeah. God helps to have an eternal perspective. Oh. Well, amen. But I also want to kind of say something else with this. Um, let's see. I, 
I, I missed one thing here. I, I really want to hit. Lost my spot, but it's okay. Okay, let's just keep let's keep going. I had something I was going to share. I'll share it in a minute. All right. But this kind of talks very much about what this is. The person who doesn't make the most of what they got. Okay? So as this 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15, Paul writes, the quality of materials used by anyone building on this foundation will soon be made apparent. And when, you know, when we talk about building materials, that's the, the materials of our life. I've taught on that several times. That's the studs. That's the things that you built your life with. All right? And the things you also added to other people's lives. It says, will soon be made apparent whether it's been built with gold, silver, and costly stones. That's the good stuff. That's the God stuff. That's the eternal stuff. Or wood, hay, and straw. That's the temporary stuff. That's the stuff the locusts and cane worms eat in your life. That's the sin stuff. That's the problems, okay? Uh, so whatever you build with. It says, their work will soon become evident for the day. That's the day of judgment for believers. We'll make it clear. Because it will be revealed by blazing fire. And the fire will test and prove the workmanship of each builder. If his work stands the test of fire, he will be rewarded. I promise you, wood, hay, and straw ain't going to stand the test. <laughs> Look here. It says, verse 15, If his work is consumed by the fire, he will suffer great loss. You see that? That's the punishing blows right there. The great loss right there that happens at the judgment seat, I believe. It says, yet he himself will barely escape destruction like one being rescued out of a burning house. I think mean, that scripture just came to mind to pair with this because it definitely brings some light into this. Amen. And see, I'm sorry. I, I had something I really wanted to hit and I lost my spot. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Uh, all right, we'll roll back with this. But right, every servant who knows what pleases his master. I want to talk about that a little bit. You know you're not accountable for what you don't know. You know that? You, God will not hold you accountable for something you had no idea about. You know that? The thing is, and, and, and I want to kind of tie this in with the fact of there's, there's a big deal whenever... I'm sorry, I'm all over the place tonight. I'm not trying to be. Um, but I had a big thought run because, you know, we're, we, we're, when we know to do good and we don't do it, it's sin, the Bible says, you know. I'm still here, camera people. Sorry. But, uh, but the Bible says, to them who knows what to do and does not do it, to them it is sin. Okay? So if you know what to do and you don't do it, then that's a sin. But if you don't know what to do and you don't do it, it's not a sin because you just don't know it. You don't know any better. And I was going to kind of touch on this um, and feel like I'm getting off track, but I'm trying not to. But... Um, there's a beautiful promise in Scripture, and that's one of them right there. If you don't know any better and you blow it, God's not going to be harsh on you like if you knew what to do and didn't do it. You know what I'm saying? And that actually rolls into another thing regarding aborted babies. I want to touch that tonight. You know, until a child reaches an age where they understand good and evil, you know, it's right and wrong, where they have a conscience that says, okay, this is wrong and I'm not supposed to do this, or this is right and I'm supposed to do it. Until they reach that age, do you know if something happens to them before that point of understanding, they go straight to heaven? So I want to kind of say that to you guys. Every aborted baby is in heaven with Jesus. The Bible teaches that because they didn't know right and wrong. They were above reproach. They were sinless in God's sight, so they went home. All right? And every small child that something happens to, before they understand right and wrong and actually have a sin nature for Jesus to forgive, they go straight to heaven if something happens to them. And so I just want to touch that. I got off track a little bit, but the thing is, every servant who knows what pleases, yet does not do it. You with me? And so that all the children who don't know any better, they're good with Jesus. I know I got off track. Sorry, guys, but I really want to touch that because some people don't understand that all the aborted babies go straight to heaven. And every small child that doesn't know the difference between right and wrong, they're still too young, they go straight to heaven if something happens. So there's going to be a whole lot of babies around there, guys. <laughs> A lot of children to play with. You good with that, all? How about you, Andrew? Yeah. No, I know I look like I jumped off track. Sorry about that. But it was stirring in me today while I was working on this. I was like, yeah, I really want to touch that. All right. Oh, that was, it was actually right after this. But anyway, I jumped in anyway. 
But here we go, verse 48a. And I broke up 48 into two sections, A and B, for a reason. So that every servant who does not know his master's will and unknowingly, unwittingly does what is wrong will receive a less severe punishment. All right? <clears throat> so every every believer who does not know, this is a, this is a mature believer or, or a believer in general who doesn't know what to do and unknowingly does what is wrong, they're not going to receive a big punishment because they didn't know what to do. You know, if they messed up and made mistakes, they'll still answer for it, but it's not going to be the same as somebody who knowingly did something wrong. All right? And here it is right here. James 4, 17. I got ahead of myself. Sorry about that, guys. But it says, so if you know of an opportunity to do the right thing today, yet you refrain from doing it, you're guilty of sin. Okay. And then 48b and this really kind of sums it up here. Everyone to whom much was given, much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. And I think that there's, there's so much good stuff here. Because everyone to whom much was past tense given. You see that? Past tense. Of them, much will be. So you see a time span there. There's a, there's a much was given to all of us at one point, and then, guess what? After it was given to us, there's going to be a lot of will be required. Okay, We have to use it. We have to use what he entrusted to us. So, And I also, this is kind of neat because you don't see this in a lot of places. This is the Trinity right here. You see that? And from him to whom they entrusted much they. You see that? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They've invested a lot in you. They've invested a lot in me. So they will demand the more. You see that? So Jesus invested in us, but so did the Holy Spirit. And he still does. So does Father. All three of them invest in us. I love that. So they gave us a whole lot. And they're going to demand it from us. They, you know, There's a responsibility. We have to answer for everything the Holy Spirit's done in our life. We have to answer for everything Jesus has done in our life. We have to answer for everything Father's done in our life. It's really great. Um, that's the Trinity, which is kind of neat that they have that picture here. But I kind of want to talk a little bit about when when was much given to you? Now, there's a question for you guys. When was much given to you? Any answer? When? When I was born. That's right. That's right. Much was given to us when we were born, but most of most of most of what we got was given to us at the cross. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's whenever we trusted Christ at that moment, that very moment, we got Gifting, anointing, ability, vision, plans, dreams, all that was poured into us. Now, some of it was woven in at, while we were fashioning those rooms, but none of it was activated until the cross. <laughs> you know, it's like at that moment, you know, when we trusted Christ, it's like the, the charcoal lighter fluid went on it and the, the match hit it. And I was like, and it became vibrant and alive. So that's whenever much was given to us throughout our life, but all of it was activated at the cross. And that's whenever all that came into the going. Um, that's actually what the Bible says in 2 Peter 1, 3. It says, for his divine power has bestowed on us absolutely everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual life and godliness through true and personal knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. See, that's when everything really gripped us and, and, and whatever we needed came into us as we trusted Jesus. Everything came in seed form or it was stirred up or it was activated at that moment when we trusted Christ. So guess what? You got everything you need. <clears throat> no matter what you walk into, you got what you need. You're never insufficient for whatever you face. Not one time. You and Jesus are a majority. You and Holy Spirit can overcome it. Doesn't matter what it is. It's amazing. Verse 49 and 50 says, I have come to set a fire on earth. And how I wish it were already ablaze with fiery passion for God. But first, I must be immersed into the baptism of God's judgment. And I am consumed with passion as I await its fulfillment. And see, this, these two have to be looked at together. I mean, they're part of the, the context of all of them, what I'm looking at. These have to be seen together. Uh, and I like this translation here. Because some people refer to Jesus bringing judgment to the earth. No, Jesus came to bring freedom to the earth. And so, it's really good when they say fire, pa fiery passion. Because he did. Jesus came to set the earth on fire. And, but see, the thing is, the, the earth couldn't be set on fire until 
He was crucified, died, buried, or was raised again. See, first, first, I have to fulfill God's judgment. I have to I have to be judged for you and you and you and you. Then I'm going to set a fire, a passion in people's lives where they trust me and they get full of the Holy Spirit. That's when the fire is going to start roaring and spread. And so it's almost like you start with verse 50 and then go up into 49. Beautiful. I like you. Passion for God. In verse 51, don't think for a moment that I came to grant peace and harmony to everyone. No, my arrival will change everything and create hostility among you. And you know, I really, I don't know, I think that more believers need to, to kind of get a grip on the fact that the world, the world is not, I mean, yes, I want peace and I want things to improve a lot. We all do. We live here. That's where we're at. We want it. But to expect a non-believing society, culture, and a lot of non-believing leaders to somehow or another bring this beautiful, God-filled utopia, it ain't going to happen. Things are going to get worse. They just are because people, you know, people are involved. As long as people are involved, things are not going to get a lot better. You know, non-believing people. But, so, but Jesus' arrival really did change everything, and it created hostility among the people. And this is the last few verses that we'll wrap up. It says in verse 52, it says, From now on, it was from the time of Jesus... It says, even family members will be divided over me and will choose sides against one another. Fathers will be divided from sons and sons from fathers. Mothers will be divided from daughters and daughters from mothers. Mothers-in-law will be against brides and brides against mothers-in-law, all because of me. You know, that's, that's the truth. I mean, anybody in here have family members that you've had difficulty with because of Jesus? Yeah. Yeah, I think all of us could raise our hand. It just, it's what it is. It's, it's what it is. Um, but what he's talking about, I think it's interesting, is he's in, in, contained in these verses, verse 52 and 53, you've got Christians against non-Christians in one family. You've got Christians against Christians. You know, I tell you, man, Christians will fight con, con, other Christians over, over conviction. You know what? They will, man. They'll, they'll fight tooth and nail, man. I mean, it happens all the time. And Christians from different denominations will fight. <laughs> because, of course, their denomination is right and the other one's wrong. My goodness, man. Pitiful. Pitiful. The thing is, is you know, there's never a reason to fight with anybody. You know, if somebody don't agree with you, God bless them. You know? If they do agree with you, God bless them. You know, either way. Um, but that's, I, I've seen that in my own family. I mean, we've had our kids from time to time that have just really went against us hard because of our faith, you know, and I've, you know, and I, and when I, you know, years ago, I actually went after people sometimes in other denominations because I was right and they weren't, you know. I'd like to say that, uh, that I wasn't a jerk at different points in my life, but I definitely was. And you know what? I may still be a jerk yet one day. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> All of us have the potential, don't we? I'm sure we still have a little jerk DNA floating in there somewhere. Yeah, Donna. Well, Pastor David, speaking of that, growing up, it was instilled in us that we, we as Roman Catholics, were the only ones going to heaven. Everybody else was going elsewhere. Not so as Protestants. <laughs> they were either purgatory or hell. You know, there was no, yeah. no, no difference. And so yeah. I can remember. I had a very good friend that went to the Assembly of God Church. Well, to me, that was very foreign. Mm, and yeah. I said, oh, well, you know, I'm really feel sorry for you because you're, you're going to hell. You're, we're Roman Catholics, and we're the only ones going to heaven. And, you know. Kind of like a wonderful moment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, I imagine, you know, compared to the Roman Catholics, you know, the fact that, some of those Christians had way too much freedom. They didn't have enough structure and discipline. You know, I can see why you think that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, their yard was too big. They were playing too much, darn it. So, <laughs> any, other, any other thoughts or questions before we wrap up tonight? Um, I Nobody? I know somebody's got something. Yeah, please. Thank you. Then we'll take 
farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. That's it. Good job. Thank you, Patrick. Woo. Thank you, brother. Yeah, you said you said it way better than I did, Patrick. That was good. That was good. I knew I had I did the first two right, but I knew I botched that last stretch. Thank you, Patrick. That's good. But isn't that the truth? I heard that like right after I trusted Christ, I remember hearing that. And uh, it snuck with me. Most of it did anyway. <laughs> Amen. Any other thoughts before we, before we close in prayer? I think on the topic of leadership and working with leaders who are in service to take positions or become there and for various reasons, I think that uh, how we navigate, how we navigate leading from the second chair is, is a reflection of our character and that we reap what we sow. That's good. And, you know, that God, I, I ask myself when I'm working with a leader, you know, is this, is, you know, God, what am I to get out of this? And how am I to navigate it? And um, I think that's just a, I think God, God will lead us into places where we serve people that are not our ideal leader. Amen. To make us better. still speak life. We still got to bless. We still got to encourage. We still got to serve. We still got to do everything. No matter if they're being difficult, we still have the same requirements on us as if they were a perfect leader. Most of our lessons are learned not when everything's perfect, it's yeah. when things are not fun. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, you learn a lot more in the valley than you do on the mountain, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, one last thing kind of as a, a t just a quick testimony. Years ago, like a long time ago, me and Cheryl were visiting a meeting. Um, it was a revival meeting. And um, this man was a traveling uh, minister. And so I, I just got home from training or something in the military. And because this ties in what Cheryl was saying. And we're in the meeting. This guy calls me out. He says, you? And I said, man, he said, yeah. And of course, you know, I have skinhead, you know, I was healthier and bigger back then. I, I'm healthy now, but you know what I'm saying? I just was more studly, I guess, and more kind of <laughs> more cocky or whatever you want to call it. I'm saying was, John. Was. But, uh, and now I'm more chill out and relaxed and careful. But, it, but, uh, but no, I'm sitting there and he calls me up and uh, Cheryl's with me and he says, are you, he said, are you a soldier? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, well, he said, I feel like God showed me something for you and I want to share it. And this is talking about leadership. He said, I see you in a tent. And I was thinking, well, yeah, I've been in a tent a good bit. But, uh, but he said, I see you in a tent. He said, you're on a battlefield. And he said, uh, he said, you've been on the battlefield for a while. And he said, um, he said, I believe the Lord wants to share something with you. He said, the Lord says, you've been in battle and you've seen faulty leadership on the battlefield. You've seen leaders that, that weren't doing the right stuff on the battlefield. He said, but God wants you to know he placed you under those leaders so you'd see the wrong way to do things because you're going to do them the right way. Mm -hmm. And see, there's value. I'm kind of saying that because there's always value in good and bad. It doesn't matter. So, yeah, that brought that back. I remember that from a long time ago. So, let's close in prayer. Amen. So, John, would you close, brother? Oh. Dear Lord, we just uh, thank you for the message tonight. Let us take a whole bunch of it with us. Take the big words and bring them here. Lord, it's just so much to live for. Yeah. Hey, thank you for being here tonight, and thank you for joining us online.